Good evening and thank you for joining us. I am Nancy Jarvis and tonight we're in conversation with Mark Danner, an extraordinary journalist who has written about human rights abuses for over 30 years. Mark is currently Chancellor's Professor of English and Journalism at UC Berkeley and the James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College, New York. He began his career at The New Yorker and The New York Review of Books. A former MacArthur Fellow, he also has a longtime association with the Telluride Film Festival. Mark is not an armchair analyst. He has covered Central America, Haiti, the Balkans, Iraq, and the greater Middle East on the ground. His new book, Spiral, Trapped in the Forever War, has its origins in an invitation by John Hennessy, the president of Stanford University, to deliver the Tanner Lectures on Human Values. The book explores the battle against terrorism that began in 2001 and its effect on America. It is intended to provoke discussion of what kind of country Americans want. Please join me in welcoming Mark Danner. Mark, before engaging the thesis of your book, I thought it would be enlightening to uh, learn a little bit more about your career, particularly for our listeners who may be searching for ways to contribute meaningfully in today's world. You're a spectacular product of a liberal arts education. At Harvard, you studied philosophy, literature, religion, art history, and international relations and graduated with an interdisciplinary honors concentration. I would appreciate your telling us how that led you to Manhattan and New York, the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books, and then on for 30 years to independent investigation of human rights abuses in all of the corners of the globe. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nancy, for asking that, and thank you all for um, being here this evening, uh, that's a very large question. Um, how did, you're here, how did you get here? Um, and, uh, you know, my last book, uh, the one before this one, I dedicated it to my mother uh, in partial answer, as I said, to her constant question, why don't you go somewhere nice for a change? <laughs> um, so I, uh, I suppose that the question of how uh, I got here is, first of all, should be answered by uh, the word serendipity. I certainly didn't intend to uh, write about the things I write about. Um, I didn't have any plan to do that. Um, I very much appreciate what you said about uh, uh, a hum humanities education. I'm very much in favor of humanities education. Uh, and it is true, if I'm a spectacular product of such uh, in education, as you very generously said, it's essentially because I couldn't make up my mind. I was a uh, philosophy major. Uh, Harvard had a very mathematically inclined philosophy department at the time, uh, which didn't particularly please me. I migrated to religion, uh, after that to uh, uh, English, then to literature. Um, and as you say, I, my final concentration was really a combination of philosophy and literature, uh, I had a very broad interest in the humanities in general, and by this I mean uh, an attempt through clear-eyed looking, seeing, reading, to try to understand the world, to try to understand uh, what is happening around us. And I think that uh, that education has been enormously helpful to me in trying to get <clears throat> or at least I hope it's been uh, helpful to me in trying to get beyond uh, the narratives uh, that we use to understand uh, the world. And by those narratives, I mean uh, the war on terror is one, for example. Um, how do you get beyond this notion that we are fighting terrorism and fighting terrorism and fighting terrorism uh, and get beyond this kind of arc of understanding uh, and get uh, to, uh, I'd call a more baseline conception of what exactly we're doing. And in this book I try to describe in Spiral, and the image of Spiral is 
the idea of you start at a fixed point and you keep circling, circling, and you get farther and farther away from the point where you began. Uh, and I try to ask the question, why have we done this in the War on Terror? Why in the first year of the War on Terror were there 700 terrorist attacks uh, around the world? In this past year, there were 33,000. Both of those figures come from the Department of State. Uh, and I think that um, one of the things that uh, philosophy taught me, and literary criticism as well, is really how to read documents, um, how to try to get to the bottom of bureaucratic stratagems, how to try to understand the workings of particular organizations. I think it's impossible uh, to understand the war on terror, for example, without a conception of the bureaucracies, the national security bureaucracies that grew up in the United States in the wake of the Second World War, uh, that grew up in the wake of the National Security Act of 1947, uh, when the Defense Department was created, when the Central Intelligence Agency was created, when the National Security Agency was created. All of these institutions were there on 9-11, and in a sense, having had a 10-year hiatus since the end of the Cold War, kind of slowly rumbled back into action. A new Cold War, in a sense, uh, when it comes to America's national security bureaucracies, had begun. Uh, and I think um, looking at that history is absolutely essential to understanding um, how the United States has fought the war on terror and why the country seems to have made, with so many smart people in control of these bureaucracies, what I consider to be momentous mistakes. Um, and I don't think those mistakes are by happenstance. I think they are deeply embedded in our history. Um, and you can detect them, you can study them and try to understand them uh, if you look at the documents, if you carefully, if you know how to read. Um, and when I say read, I'm talking about reading and interpreting, trying to see beyond uh, the documents into how they fit uh, into a larger history. And I like to think that a humanities education um, at its best uh, teaches you how to do that. You know, I gave a commencement address at Berkeley oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, which was entitled, What Are You Going to Do With That? And it was the quotation from parents who say to their you know, child when he or she comes home from the first year of college and, said, and says, I'm going to be an English major, or I'm going to be a philosophy major, what are you going to do with that? And I was uh, trying to answer that question, that in fact, there are a lot of things uh, that you can do with that. Uh, principally trying to see through the kind of mephitic cloud of propaganda, uh, fragmentary stories, uh, bits and pieces of slogans and sloganeering that constitute our political discussion today, Try to, trying to see through it uh, and actually see why things uh, happen the way they do, which I think is uh, one of the things I've been trying to do for the last uh, few decades, to try to understand uh, why massacres and other human rights abuses happen, to try to understand uh, why the United States behaves the way it does in the world, uh, and in specifically for this book, to try to understand how the U.S. has become involved in a war on terror that's boundless in space, boundless in time, seems to have no sense of an ending, uh, and has involved breaking many of our most basic precepts about what supposedly constitutes uh, and uh, separates the United States from other countries. Um, it's led the U.S. to torture prisoners, uh, which is against federal law and against international law. It's led the U.S. to imprison uh, people indefinitely. There's still 76 prisoners uh, imprisoned at Guantanamo who are there, so far as we know, for the rest of their natural lives. Um, it's led the United States to assassinate four to 5,000 people using drones. Um, it's led to warrantless wiretapping. All of these things are going on rather quietly. There aren't many protests about them. Um, and it also has led us to have a presidential candidate this year who advocates uh, very forthrightly, very angrily, uh, torturing prisoners. Uh, not only waterboarding, but doing, as he says, much worse. Uh, even if it doesn't work, they deserve it because of what they do to us, he has said. 
Uh, he advocates killing the families of terrorists. He advocates a number of things that I would argue 15 years ago would have been absolutely unheard of in our public life. And yet now uh, we may say, goodness, this is shocking, but in general it fits into uh, a changed, dramatically altered polity uh, that I think we very rarely take account of. It's grown up all around us. A quiet war is continuing right now. It's going on on the other side of the world. We're attacking with drones in Yemen and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia and Libya, possibly other places. We have troops on the ground in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, one can go on with this. Um, but I think one of the difficulties we have is actually seeing what's in front of us. Um, I think that becomes very difficult. You know, there's an old phrase in, in journalism, you know, the, the really, the interesting story is dog bites, excuse me, the interesting story is man bites dog, right? Dog bites man is not a story. Man bites dog, that's a story. And the problem is that increasingly, as you have a war that continues quietly, unendingly, uh, it's no longer a story. It's simply part of the world as it exists. It's hard for us to see it. It's hard for us to see how things have changed, how our approach to politics has altered, uh, and how our daily existence has been changed by a, a forever war, as I uh, call it in this book. Uh, so, you know, I'm glad you started with this as a point of departure because I, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for my education um, because I think in the best sense of the word, it taught me to look at things uh, and to try to see a, a little bit deeper. And when young people, as they increasingly do, ask me what they should do, you know, in preparation for a career in journalism or writing, um, I tend to urge them, you know, I'm very much a big fan of, uh, of a humanistic um, education, a very big fan, um, because I think uh, we all need to do better at the basic work of seeing. Uh, to, to take up the thread from your book, in Spiral, you decry the politics of fear. You describe it as embedding the rhetoric of the war on terror into the political struggle between the two parties. Since you wrote that book, I think that that, that tendency has increased, if anything. I think we all acknowledge that it exists. How do we counteract it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know really how to begin uh, to talk about how to counteract it because, you know, we have a basic phenomenon. It's called terrorism. Uh, there are historical reasons it's called that, but um, it's very useful just to look at that word. Uh, terrorism is about uh, taking action that causes terror in a population. Uh, it's not, it's central... Uh, uh, reality is not killing. Killing is, in a sense, a kind of byproduct. What you really want to do is cause fear. And you cause fear to have a secondary result, to have people do things. Um, and one of my contentions in this book is that, you know, this difference between 700-odd attacks uh, in the year after 9-11 and 33,000 now uh, the difference in the fact that at the time of the 9-11 attacks, Al-Qaeda was a thousand or so militants in the mountains of Afghanistan, whereas now uh, you have jihadist groups, including Al-Qaeda, in dozens, literally dozens of countries around the world. You have not one international network of uh, terrorists, very able international network of terrorists, Al-Qaeda, not one but two. Uh, the Islamic State, which came of the Iraq War, has joined al-Qaeda. It's much bigger. It's occupying territory the size of Great Britain over uh, uh, the border of Iraq and, and Syria. It has 30 to 40,000 uh, fighters. Um, uh, how did this happen? In other words, how did a small group of 1,000 or so fighters isolated in the mountains of Afghanistan lead to this enormous phenomenon that has dominated the foreign policy of the United States uh, ever since 9-11. How did it happen uh, that 
while there may have been 1,000 militants in 2001, there are now probably 40 or 50,000. they are sympathizers in all the Western countries, thousands of them, including in the United States. How did that happen? And I think, you know, how does it happen that you uh, design and carry out an act, uh, the purpose of which is to cause fear, how does it happen that within 15 years, you've increased your numbers 50-fold, at least? How does it happen that you're now in every country of the Middle East and uh, are a predominant force in a number of countries in the Middle East, Yemen, Libya, uh, Syria, Iraq? How has that happened in that short amount of time? And I would say, you know, there's a basic precept here. If you don't have an army, use your adversary's army. And Al-Qaeda attacked on September 11th in order to provoke this I call the strategy of provocation, the United States to do stupid things that would increase their recruitment. Uh, they wanted, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda wanted the United States, and we know this from the documents, I have one right here that sets it out very explicitly, they wanted to provoke the United States to, invading, to invade a major Muslim country, uh, to put on the television screen every day images of Americans repressing, suppressing, abusing Muslims. They thought that the United States would invade Afghanistan and there would be a struggle to the death, a quagmire there, as there had been with the Soviet Union a decade before. Uh, the United States military would be destroyed in Afghanistan. The U.S. would disappear as a superpower, as the Soviet Union did. That was the theory. Uh, but the United States obliged al-Qaeda uh, by doing something uh, much more useful to them. We invaded Iraq. Uh, we gave them those images. In fact, uh, it was a dream, a, a, a fantasy of bin Laden's to have images like those from Abu Ghraib, which still, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, I should say, which still fertilize the ranks of jihadists around the world. When you see a young Westerner kneeling in this vacant landscape in an orange jumpsuit, with a man in black standing behind him with a knife at his throat, declaiming and then cutting his head off, this image that we all know now, uh, sadly. When you see that, how many here realize that that's a reference to Guantanamo, that orange jumpsuit? I assure you everybody in the Middle East does. Um, these imagery, this imagery uh, for the Islamic State and for Al-Qaeda is a kind of synthetic imagery that goes back and forth and that it's about the United States in many cases, although Americans tend not to, to realize it. Uh, so the strategy of provoca provocation led us uh, to invade Iraq. Um, it vastly increased the recruitment of Al-Qaeda and other jihadist groups. It started in 2003, the Islamic State, uh, which made a series of dramatic attacks in August of that year. Uh, blew up the United Nations headquarters, blew up the Jordanian embassy, uh, blew up the Grand Mosque in Najaf. Um, and, uh, you know, the Islamic State was absolutely a stepchild, direct stepchild of uh, the Iraq War. So, in effect, you know, you ask originally this question uh, way back when, <laughs> um, how do we stop this? How do we be, stop being frightened? And, uh, you know, I think it's very difficult to come up with an answer because uh, the second half of this dynamic, the first half is causing fear, the second half is you will always have politicians, leaders, who uh, find it incumbent on them to ride the wave of fear. And this happened after 9-11. It's happening in our election at the moment. Um, uh, Terrorism creates an opportunity in which politicians in the terrorized country, uh, the phrase is, uh, surf fear for votes. That's Claire, Senator Claire McCaskill's phrase. Uh, and you see it right now with, with Mr. Trump. You see a very, you know, absolutely opportunistic politics uh, in which uh, he is trying to get elected on fear. Um, how can you counteract it? Well, there could have been a different reaction to September 11th. Uh, the president could have gotten up and, and said, this is the most horrible attack on the United States in our history. 
Uh, it's absolutely shocking. It's suicide bombing, it killed nearly 3,000 civilians. We will bring these people to justice, but we're not going to overreact. There's no reason to invade any countries. We have a target of this militant group. We are going to track them down and kill them. But there is no reason to occupy anywhere. There's no reason to send our army. Uh, we're going to fight this war with special forces, uh, intelligence uh, assets. We're going to track down every one of these people. Uh, but we're going to do it uh, while not doing what they want us to do, which is they want us to alienate the Muslim world. They want us to alienate young Muslims so they will join their group. And we're going to do everything we can to avoid doing that. Our actions are going to be surgical. They're going to be direct. Um, they are going to attack the problem. We are probably not going to eliminate all terrorism, but we are going to protect the country and we're going to destroy the group that attacked us while making sure that we don't create more terrorists at the same time. And I think that kind of clear leadership might have made a difference. Um, I think, though, that the United States leadership at the time of 9-11 uh, had bigger fish to fry. That is, many of the people in leadership positions, particularly in the Defense Department, believed that the United States was in a so-called unipolar moment, unipolar meaning one pole, uh, that the bipolar world had ended, there was only the United States as a great power, and 9-11 to them represented an opportunity uh, to be the predominant power in the world, to show off our military force, to use shock and awe, uh, and to send the American army into a major Arab capital where the United States could restore its credibility by occupying as it happened in Iraq. And I think that was precisely, precisely uh, the wrong strategy. Um, and I think the fact is that that strategy led the U.S. political leadership to use the 9-11 attacks as a spur to military action and to, in effect, increase the fear in the country. In other words, to exaggerate the threat of al-Qaeda, to say that this is an existential threat to us. And al-Qaeda wasn't an existential threat to us. In the first speech that President Bush gave in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the big speech to Congress, he compared al-Qaeda specifically uh, to Hitler and to Stalin, uh, to the Soviet Union and to Nazi Germany. Um, very explicit quote. And this quote was uh, misbegotten. You know, this did not, Al-Qaeda had no enormous army. It was not going to destroy the country. Um, in effect, it was trying to provoke us to do things that would help the organization. And all along, we have continually done those things, which is one of the points of, uh, of Spiral. We have a few minutes more for, for our conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that during the question period, there will be many questions on the, the, the current uh, war on terror. But I'd, in the last few minutes before we take questions, I'd like you to step back a moment and think about your coverage of violence in El Salvador and Haiti, the Balkans, and the Middle East. Is there any thread among those investigations? Or is each case unique? You spent your life doing this. Is, what are, the, is there a, uh, are there lessons to be learned in the entire trajectory or not? Oh, boy, why do you ask such difficult questions? Because <laughs> um, I'm an old friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say there are many uh, things in common. And, uh, uh, you know, for me personally, one of the things all of those places have in common is the kind of voluptuous thrill of, of reporting, uh, of getting to know a new place, of trying to understand the strangeness of it, of thinking when you're far away from it that you understand it, uh, and arriving and finding out uh, that you know nothing, that suddenly you're dependent not on accounts of newspaper writers and, and uh, writers for, uh, who covered it, but you're suddenly dependent on your own sense impressions, on what you hear, what you see, uh, uh, what you feel, what you taste. Um, so part of, I, part of it, I think, is, is just the, the thrill of trying to understand somewhere 
and uh, particularly a place that, uh, you know, I, I called my last book Stripping Bear of the Body, which is after a quote by a sometime Haitian president. He was overthrown in a coup after five months, as just about all Haitian presidents are these days. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, political violence um, is like stripping bare the body. The better to place the stethoscope and hear what goes on beneath the skin. Um, and I think that's very much true, uh, that you see and understand a society uh, best when you see it essentially tearing itself apart, and the various parts uh, going after each other. And I think, indeed, that's true of post-9-11 uh, uh, America as well. Um, so I think that's one thing I would say is a common thread, is just my own uh, pleasure, really, and intellectual interest in trying to understand uh, places. Um, a second thread, I think, is the influence of uh, the United States and how prone the U.S. is uh, to use its power uh, in ways um, uh, that turn out to be misbegotten, uh, misinformed, uh, counterproductive, uh, where consequences uh, are surprising uh, and go in a different direction than U.S. policymakers, however high-minded they might have been, which sometimes happens, uh, uh, that are completely different from what they uh, planned. And I think there's an interesting trajectory there. You know, when you look at the invasion of Iraq, which I talked about a moment ago, many, many, many of my friends who had similar political sympathies, and I'm talking about reporters a lot of times, uh, intellectuals, writers, uh, to my shock, supported uh, the invasion of Iraq. And of course, this is a phenomenon that's well known, liberal interventionists. Uh, great many people, good friends of mine, uh, uh, were for it. Uh, and I was so shocked by this, I ended up debating publicly against the war uh, continually with Christopher Hitchens and uh, Leon Wieseltier and various other uh, people. And I think the reason for that has to do with the thread that you're talking about, which is that uh, in the wake of the Cold War, uh, and particularly during the Balkan Wars, uh, which were singularly bloody wars, you know, genocidal wars, um, people started to ask themselves, as Madeleine Albright put it to Colin Powell, why do we have this fancy military of yours if we're not going to use it? You know, if you're on the ground in Bosnia or in Sarajevo, for example, looking at the aftermath of, of a mortar bomb that kills 68 people, as I was, and you look up in the air and see uh, an American jet cir fighter bomber circling around and around and doing nothing, you ask yourself, why doesn't the U.S. do something? You know, these people are being massacred. They're being killed. They're civilians. The United States is all powerful. I mean, this is the unipolar moment. Why doesn't the U.S. act? And I think that that question, which was asked repeatedly in the 90s about Bosnia and about Rwanda as well, where there was an enormous genocide, um, really persisted into uh, 2001 uh, and 2003 uh, into the beginnings of the Iraq War. Uh, I think many of the people uh, uh, who you might have been expected to be against a war of choice in the Middle East, looked at Iraq and said, well, why shouldn't the U.S. act to bring down this dictator, which is, of course, the way the war was sold by Washington. Uh, and I think there is a kind of thread running through all the interventions you talked about, which has to do with the wisdom of U.S. action, whether the United States can act in the world in a way that brings positive results. And I, at the beginning of the discussion about Iraq, I was vehemently, from the beginning, uh, against the invasion. And I wish I could say because I knew it would be a disaster, and I, but there was something very instinctual to me that said there'd be a disaster that I think lies in the fact, uh, in the reporting I did, in particular, oddly enough, uh, in Haiti, which is about as different a country from Iraq as you can possibly understand. Haiti, for me, was a kind of education uh, in, in foreign policy and in foreign reporting. It's an amazing, fascinating place. And I really got an education there on how U.S. action, you know, the United States is 300 million people, Haiti is 8 million. The U.S. tried again and again to alter Haitian politics. And even though it was, it, it's an exponentially greater power, again and again, its efforts came to grief in Haiti. And I think this left me with a feeling that uh, 
you know, U.S. power, in fact, is not very useful in creating a new order. It's very good at blowing things up. We're very good at destroying things, at destroying regimes, at bombing, but actually creating a new order to put in place of what we've destroyed is something that we really don't know how to do. Uh, and I think that's been demonstrated again and again, and I've seen it in my own uh, writing life. So I think that's one of the threads, I think, that runs through uh, what I've written about, absolutely. Okay, now we will have a chance to take your questions. And um, this goes right back to your English lit background. <laughs> it says, is the title of your book inspired by Yeats' poem, The Second Coming? <laughs> um, uh, I think... You know, I'd like to say absolutely. God, somebody finally got it, you know. Um, but but the, truth, the truth is that it's not. Um, uh, spiral uh, itself, the word came from my agent who read the manuscript and, and came up with the word trapped in the forever war, I think was the subtitle of the lectures uh, I gave at, um, uh, at Stanford that you referred to, Nancy. So it didn't originally come from that, but I may in the future use that as the explanation for where it came from because it's much more litera literarily satisfying. I would so recommend that too. I, 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 henceforth, I will, henceforth, I will do that. Um, this is from a member of the uh, audience who is uh, U.S. Army retired. When there was a draft, national service, theoretically there was more of a connection between the policymakers, populace, and the armed forces. Should we return to or go to a mandatory national service obligation for citizens? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I honestly don't uh, uh, know what I think about that. I mean, it's interesting that after Vietnam, the military was really redesigned during the 70s after the draft uh, to prevent, uh, I mean, you think, you think that the question kind of presumes uh, uh, as a premise that uh, having a draft will act as a kind of restraint on American action because it will embed decisions about um, uh, U.S. intervention um, in uh, much more within the populace. It will give many more people of different classes uh, a stake uh, once the United States intervenes abroad. Um, the interesting thing is that in the 70s, the U.S. military was designed in such a way that the U.S. could not fight a long engagement without calling up the reserves calling up the National Guard, which is why in Iraq you had this amazing uh, patchwork of uh, professional soldiers and reservists. Uh, this was supposed to restrain any long-time intervention uh, because, you know, supposedly the populace would react against it. It wouldn't be possible to fight it with reservists. In effect, in effect though, what happened was you did use the reserves. Uh, people had to go to deployment after deployment. Some people had three and four uh, deployments. Uh, it was very unfair to uh, a lot of families. Um, but so it didn't work. You know, the theory of the 70s that this would act as a kind of restraint on uh, uh, U.S. adventurism around the world, in effect, did not work. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea of a draft because I think it uh, spreads the burden equitably as it is not now spread. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the U.S. military uh, is a relatively smaller professional force now uh, where everybody fighting uh, at least until recently, were volunteers. Now they've had stop gaps and they're forcing people, uh, as I implied, to fight more than they signed up for. Uh, so I guess I'm not, at the end of the day, I'm not sympathetic to that, uh, to that proposal. But This is a question from a Bard College alum. Ah. In response to rec recent events all over France, do you think the state of emergency is more helpful or harmful and do you think the rhetoric Hollande is using will have long-lasting negative uh, effects on the population? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, you know, 
in effect, we have a state of emergency in this country that's lasted uh, 15 years. I mean, in effect, not only in effect, we have a legal state of emergency, and we have what I call in the book a state of exception, uh, uh, which I tried to describe a little while back, uh, that's lasted for a very long time. Uh, the French have a formal state of emergency. Um, uh, you know, the truth is that when it comes to terrorism, one of the things that happens is that politicians feel uh, that they have to do something. In other words, each terrorist attack requires, uh, the phrase was after 9-11, taking the gloves off. And the implication of taking the gloves off is to say that before the attack, the gloves were on. In other words, the implication is that the reason the attack succeeded was because the government wasn't being tough enough, strong-willed enough, powerful enough, repressive enough, if you will, uh, to prevent the attack. And the fact is that this logic, logic is not true. The 9-11 attacks, if the, the United States government, the national security bureaucracy, did not need any new laws, would not have needed any new laws to have prevented the 9-11 attacks. And in effect, uh, there were many, many close calls uh, which would have and could have led to those attacks being scuttled in the months before September 11th. Um, you had someone in Phoenix who, uh, in the FBI, who said, you know, there are many people who are training in flight simulators from the Middle East who don't want to learn how to uh, uh, land necessarily and take off. Shouldn't we investigate this? Nothing was done. You had Musawi, who was arrested in uh, Minnesota for exactly the same reason, who the FBI was desperate to get a court order to look at his laptop. The court order was not, or I'm sorry, it wasn't a court order, it was from the Justice Department. It was not granted. Had that laptop been looked at, uh, it's quite possible that the 9-11 attacks would have been stopped. And I could cite other uh, things in the months before September 11th. So uh, uh, including, by the way, the two of the 9-11 terrorists uh, were under CIA observation until they arrived in San Diego when the CIA did not hand them off, as they are supposed to do, to the FBI. And we've heard again and again that the reason this happened was because they failed to connect the dots. It was some bureaucratic oversight. It wasn't. It clearly, there was clearly something intentional about this. Um, a lot of people think, and I tend to agree with this, uh, that the CIA hoped to turn these, hoped the Saudis would turn these people and make them into informants. Um, uh, it didn't work out quite that way. They flew a plane into the Pentagon. Anyway, th my general point here is that when you have an attack, there is immediate enormous pressure on politicians to do something. And many times, you know, cranking up the repression, cranking up uh, uh, the state of emergency and so on, is not required uh, to necessarily stop terrorist attacks. I mean, some, if you have... 10 terrorist attempts, one will probably succeed. One will probably succeed in this country, I think, leading up to the election. I'm going to make that prediction right now. The fact is you're not going to stop all of them. And because one succeeds does not necessarily mean that the gloves were on and the gloves need to be taken off, but you have this kind of uh, cycle that begins where each successful attack cause more, causes more uh, repressive steps to be taken, whether or not they are necessary. And I think that is, uh, that's happening in France. Uh, I think it will happen in Germany. Uh, I think it is likely to happen in this country if you have an attack in late October uh, leading up to the election, which I think is, sort of, is rather predictable. Uh, I, I mean, I, who knows, maybe it won't happen. Uh, but if I were the people in the Islamic State in Raqqa, uh, in their headquarters, I would be planning an attack before the election because I would want to elect the Republican candidate. I think that would be enormously useful for them. Uh, and I think uh, really that's kind of the way he will be elected if, if indeed you have an attack uh, very close to the election. Um, but, but if that happens, 
uh, you probably will have more of a state of emergency, you'll have steps taken and so on, and it does not follow necessarily that those things are needed. I realize that sounds a little paradoxical, but one of the problems with terrorism is that there will be some successful attacks. If you have enough attempts, there will be some successful attacks. It just will happen. There's a question from a member of the World Affairs Council Summer Institute. Um, I would argue that America has spiraled away from a clear foreign policy doctrine. How do we return to a clear doctrine and ensure America stays on point? <coughs> well, the U.S. has many doctrines. Uh, the one in the Middle East is the Carter Doctrine, which obviously goes back to 1980, I believe, or 79 or 80. Um, and I would agree that that one is outdated. It's about protecting the Middle East uh, oil from any foreign usurpers. Uh, that is what governs U.S. policy, uh, you know, grand policy in the Middle East to this day. I think that's uh, probably out of date. Um, but I think in a broader sense, uh, we have had, uh, really since the handoff of uh, imperial power in the late 40s from Great Britain to the United States, uh, we have carried a kind of imperial burden in the Middle East that's uh, been s quite similar to that of Great Britain and France, uh, the former colonial powers there. Uh, and I think that order is breaking down. I think you see it breaking down all around you if you look at the map. There are hot wars going on in Syria, in Iraq, uh, in Yemen, in Libya. Uh, many of these concern borders that were put into place uh, in the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1916, so exactly a century ago. Uh, the Islamic State um, uh, put out a great video. I really recommend their videos. They're, they're very uh, entertaining and highly, very well produced called Breaking the Borders, when they bulldozed the border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, and their big belief is that these imperial borders must be destroyed, that were these borders that were imposed a century ago by the Western uh, powers. But I think this old imperial order that we inherited from the British and the French is indeed uh, collapsing. And I think it's unclear uh, what will take its place. Um, I do know that uh, the United States won't determine what will take its place. The people uh, of the region will. And one of the interesting things about Obama's uh, foreign policy is he has tried to step back slightly uh, from the Middle East. He has almost heroically avoided getting involved in Syria, which I think almost any other president in his position would be deeply involved in Syria. Most of his senior advisors were uh, pushing uh, for greater involvement in Syria. Um, but uh, I think he is right, he has been right uh, to stay out of it. And I think we're gonna see a lot more turmoil uh, in the Middle East. And I think the United States does not have the wisdom uh, to produce uh, a successor uh, order in the Middle East. You know, it's interesting, uh, around the time of the Iraq invasion, uh, by the United States, there was a lot of talk in conservative, neoconservative circles, as they were called then, of creative destabilization, creative chaos, that we're going to go in and bust them up. You know, we're going to bust up this old order by invading Iraq, and we'll start a democratic tsunami. That was the phrase of one neoconservative, that the idea, I wrote about this before the war, that, you know, we'll invade Iraq, we'll make it a democracy or a representative government, uh, and that will lead to a democratic revolution in Iran. That will lead to the fall of Assad in Syria. That will lead to uh, the fall of Arafat, who is then running the Palestinian Authority. Um, you would have all these democracies. It'll establish all, you know, it'll be like what happened in Eastern Europe. Um, and indeed, there was a destabilization, but it wasn't necessarily a creative one. Um, we don't know what will be created there, but I think, indeed, one of the consequences of the invasion has been this massive destabilization uh, of the Middle East, of the old order. It shows the fragility of the old order, and it's this old order, it's worth saying, and this we come back to the beginning of the discussion, which is what the jihadists on 9-11 were seeking to destabilize. 
uh, you know, they were not only trying to provoke the United States, they were also striking at what they called the far enemy, the far enemy being the U.S., which in their view was the puppet master holding the strings of the puppets of the Middle East, Mubarak, the House of Saud and Saudi Arabia, other rulers, other autocrats who relied on our support. Uh, how do we overthrow these autocrats? Well, we can't overthrow them directly because they're too strong and ruthless. We'll overthrow them by attacking the far enemy and driving it out of the Middle East. And then if we cut the strings of those, of the puppeteer, the puppets will fall limply to earth and we will be able to take over Egypt, we'll be take, able to take over Saudi Arabia and so on. So our presence as a, as a neo-imperial power in the region was what provoked, you know, when you ask, why do they hate us? You know, this question in the American press, that's why they hate us, you know, because we're supporting autocrats who are repressing them. It's not that complicated. Uh, we hear again and again in the US press, you know, why are they radicalized? Why are, as if it's this mysterious drug that they're taking that radicalizes people. But it's not, I don't think it's, I mean, uh, radicalization is an interesting phenomenon and, and complicated, but at its root, it's not very complicated. The US is the imperial power. It's supporting autocratic regimes. Autocratic regimes are repressive. Uh, they want to overthrow them. Um, and to, notwithstanding, to put in their place even more autocratic regimes, that's quite true. Um, but, uh, so I'm sorry, I've gone far afield from the question of what should be the US, new US doctrine, but you know, Obama has wanted to pivot to Asia, and he's been frustrated throughout by uh, this complete attention to the Middle East. And he has argued, and I agree with him, that it's somewhat misplaced, uh, that this dominant attention uh, that we're paying to the Middle East and South Asia uh, is not in the US interest, and I, I tend to agree. There are several questions here on Hillary Clinton, so I'll give them to you together. Oh, how should Hillary Clinton approach terrorism leading up to the election? And how do you assess Hillary Clinton as a hawk, the mistake of her vote for the Iraq war and her policy going forward? <laughs> um, uh, oh, goodness. Well, uh, if I were in the place of the Democratic uh, nominee, uh, as she will be, uh, then um, I would be very worried, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that in the run-up to the election, there will be uh, an attack on American uh, soil. I would find that to be a frightening uh, prospect. <clears throat> and um, if you read uh, the speech of the Republican nominee, in accepting the nomination, it is almost laying the groundwork for more chaos, more shooting of police officers, more terrorism. It's a kind of predicate for that. Um, I'm not accusing him of that, but I'm just saying that indeed it's this dark vision that needs to be confirmed by further acts. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating document if you, if you read it closely. I urge people uh, to watch uh, that speech, but what can she do in the run-up? I mean, she's not uh, in the government at the moment. Um, I think she can uh, make very clear uh, what she believes uh, policy should be about terrorism. She should make it clear that the current administration is fighting and defeating the Islamic State on the ground, that in fact some of the larger uh, acts of terrorism in Europe uh, are probably a result of the fact that they are suffering these defeats in Syria and Iraq. Uh, in a sense, terrorism is their strategic weapon, it's their air force. Uh, so the more you defeat them uh, in uh, Fallujah or maybe in Mosul, the more attacks they're going to be abroad, and that's been precisely what's been happening. Uh, I think she should try to make clear that, that uh, we can do something about this and that the United States is do, doing something about it, but it's, it's impossible to prevent all terrorism. Uh, I think she needs to speak rationally and clearly. But to say this, as I listen to myself say it, is to underline the futility of her position in relation to her opponent in the wake of an attack because the power of his politics is you know, directed at, at the limbic system, you know, the lizard brain. It's about fear. And uh, 
that is the power of his politics. And that is why, if you have a, a real attack, um, it will help him. Uh, the other thing she will do, and I, I think she should do, but she will do, is try to attack him as unsteady, as erratic, as unreliable, and to try to make enough people more afraid of him than they are of terrorists. And that is going on right now uh, at the convention. It will continue to go on uh, over the next weeks and months. Um, uh, you know, I take some solace from the fact that in the wake of the Orlando attack, uh, he made a, a real attempt uh, to seize on this and put his poll numbers up in his reaction uh, to the attack, and it didn't really work. It didn't really work. It may be because the attack was different. Uh, you know, it, it was hate crime. It was kind of mixed in a way that, yeah, I mean, imagine somebody wandering into McDonald's in Times Square and blowing themselves up and killing 30 people. Imagine the kind of impact uh, that would have. Uh, and um, But I think if I had to counsel her, uh, I would say to speak loudly and clearly about uh, terrorism, about the fact that she knows what she's doing when it comes to terrorism, she will follow these policies. But if you look at, again, the reaction to Orlando, you can see how different Trump uh, essentially said, we need to go and kill these people. And uh, Clinton did what I'm saying. And in fact, in the wake of that kind of fear, uh, he has a leg up uh, in that kind of reaction. And this is always true. Um, uh, politically. Uh, so what do I think of her as a hawk was the other uh, question. Um, I think that anyone who uh, saw themselves as, as the Salvadorans called, uh, say it, presidenciable, you know, the, uh, it's a French pronunciation, um, uh, that is possibly eligible for the presidency uh, in 2002, the Iraq, pro-Iraq war vote was the smart vote. No one who was thinking of running for office voted against uh, the war. And um, I think she thought at the time that it was the smart vote. Uh, I don't mean that you know deep down she thought it was a terrible idea, but she felt she had to vote that way for political reasons. I think uh, there is a streak in her, as the uh, questioner uh, really points out, uh, that believes in, in a strong uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy that uses as its backbone uh, military force. And I think if she was president uh, in 2011, 2012, we probably would have had an involvement on the part of the United States and Syria, which I think would have been a, a profound mistake. I, I disagree with those who think the U.S. could have played a, a predominant role and could have stopped that war early. I don't think it would have happened. So I'm a bit apprehensive uh, about uh, Clinton uh, uh, as president, if she becomes president, um, uh, although not half as apprehensive I would be as if she didn't become president, um, because she does indeed have a very uh, strong, uh, I think, aggressive streak when it comes to U.S. military power. Um, and I think if the last 15 years has shown everything, anything to us, it's that uh, prolonged and persistent use of violence uh, uh, is often counterproductive. It often is, and uh, it should also be said that uh, it can be very hard, particularly in the wake of an attack, to resist the use of violence, very hard. Uh, that the, the person in the room who advocates harsh, immediate harsh action, I'm talking about in the councils of state, uh, very often has a great advantage. You know, the certainty that indeed we have to respond fiercely and immediately. The person who counsels patients and uh, uh, a more measured response is often in a very weak position. Um, and um, I have a lot of respect for Obama uh, that he didn't intervene in Syria because I think all of his major advisors wanted him to. There's a question from a member of the audience who is preparing to join the U.S. mission to Somalia. Mm -hmm. Given our not so great track record of post-conflict nation building, what are our best capabilities to contribute to states emerging from conflict and instability? How might we promote and create space for building understanding before overreacting? Boy, that's a very good question and a, a really complicated one. Um, you know, we'd like to say that 
the key thing really is building institutions on the ground. Uh, if you look, for example, at uh, Indonesia, uh, which has really had a working democracy for the last 14, 15 years after a long period of dictatorship, uh, you can look um, at what the U.S. did there during those years of dictatorship, and one of the things it did was help NGOs, help establish civil institutions, help establish a civil society, the Ford Foundation, other organizations. This is a complicated story, needless to say, uh, and uh, contradictory in some ways, but um, uh, one would like to say that establishing such institutions, such countervailing institutions, civil institutions, um, is something that the United States actually knows how to do um, uh, and that can have long-term positive uh, effects. Um, uh, the problem is long-term positive effects that, uh, you know, people like to see uh, quick action. And, uh, I mean, Libya, look at Libya. It's a very uh, good example. The United States uh, played a major role in overthrowing the Gaddafi regime, um, there were reasons that people in the government uh, advocated this, uh, one of them being that they thought there was going to be widespread killing um, uh, during this, this revolution. Um, but in the wake of uh, the overflow of the regime, the country is divided between a couple of different governments. There's widespread violence. It threatens to break apart. Could the United States have done anything uh, to prevent this? And... Uh, you know, I'm hard pressed uh, to answer that. Um, would the U.S. have had to put, I mean, if there was a United Nations constabulary force that perhaps could have, you know, but now we're into the notion of blue helmets, of peacekeepers, uh, uh, which have had a mi very mixed record around the world. Um, I think that uh, very often in a situation like Libya, in which there are very few national institutions, in which the country is essentially stitched together, it's kind of an artificial uh, uh, country in many ways, made of three different parts, um, I don't think the U.S. could have, uh, I hate to say it, could have um, uh, done much. On the other hand, I think that the work of uh, trying to establish institutions on the ground um, uh, trying to build civic institutions within a society, particularly like Somalia, um, is God's work, you know? I think uh, it's positive, um, and it's much more likely at the end of the, the day to yield positive results um, than uh, uh, bombing the place. Um, I'm sorry, I wish I could be more, you know, um, uh, more encouraging. I think this is a question you probably can be encouraging about. Good. Um, <laughs> aren't you. cohesive neighborhoods with safe work sites, safe households, safe schools, and safe communities the first line of defense against terrorism? Um, yes, I'm, I'm definitely could be encouraging about that. I think that's I think that's true. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the problem, I mean, really the United States, when you look at it, has been enormously successful. You know, I gave a figure at the beginning, uh, according to the State Department, 772 terrorist attacks in 2002 around the world, 33,000 nearly last year. But what is remarkable is how few there were in the United States. Uh, for most of those years, up to this year, fewer people were killed by terrorists in the U.S. than were killed by lightning. So the United States actually uh, has been quite successful in protecting its population uh, in general uh, until, uh, you know, you had the Islamic State basically calling on people to attack in any way possible. Um, and uh, I think the thing that the United States has done um, is by its foreign policy increase the number of willing of people willing to attack it, particularly within the country. I mean that's what you've seen lately, um, and I think part of the radicalization problem has to do with U.S. the aggressive U.S. foreign policy. Um, to get back to the notion of neighborhoods, um, 
certainly, you know, Donald Trump actually has talked about this repeatedly. He claims that those attacks that have happened in the U.S., uh, others in the neighborhood, that is, other Muslims in the neighborhood knew about them. We have to put pressure on these people to, to talk because they didn't talk, and if they did talk, we could prevent them. Um, I think that's precisely the wrong approach, a coercive one. Um, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you need people to voluntarily uh, give information and to not fear that the people who they talk about will be sent to Guantanamo, uh, which is to say that, you know, our system of justice is a key part of this cycle of information uh, if you want people, in essence, to talk about upcoming attacks or their worries about certain people who, are, who they suspect are planning attacks and so on, you have to have a justice system uh, that is reliable and not uh, unjust. Um, and we went far after 9-11 to uh, uh, blighting uh, our system of justice. And Guantanamo still stands as a kind of blight on our system of justice, uh, I think. But I do, you know, we, we hear again and again uh, that because the Islamic, the Muslim community here, including large pockets of Muslims in Dearborn, Michigan and other places uh, in Minnesota, um, because it's a much better integra integrated community, um, that uh, it's not a situation like, like France, for example. Um, uh, we will hear more, talk, more and more talk about that until an attack comes from that community when uh, the rhetoric, I'm afraid, uh, uh, will shift. Unfortunately, we are out of time for tonight, but uh, I want to remind you all that uh, Mark's book is for sale here, and he will be here to sign copies. Um, and many thanks to all of you for your questions. I'm sure that Mark will be here for a bit if you want to add, ask him personally. Um, and on behalf of the World Affairs Council, please join me in thanking Mark Danner.